This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. James chapter 2 this morning in your Bibles. James chapter number 2. We're going to pick up where we left off in the book of James. Um, I'm going to read the whole section because it, it's all one thought and flows together. And then we'll dive in here this morning with James chapter 2 verses 15 uh, through 18 this morning. Uh, we'll start reading uh, in verse 14 what we introduced this section with last week. Uh, James chapter 2 starting with verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing now how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then, how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith, without works, is dead also. And James repeats that phrase over and over. Faith, without works, is dead also. This is a continuation of last week, so it's the concept of a double-minded man's view of how faith connects to works. Uh, Let's pray and we'll jump right in here. Lord, we thank you for this text of Scripture this morning. Um, And Lord, as we look into it, we ask that you would open our eyes to truth and what we need to know. And Lord, uh, open our eyes to the the needs around us. And Lord, would would our faith connect your promises and character to the needs around us? And would people see the life of Christ flowing through us uh, to those around us this morning? Lord, would you, even as we we speak and preach here, we ask that you would uh, set the distractions of life aside this morning and Just enable us to focus our thoughts on you. And Lord, would your spirit be at work among us in your son's name. Amen. By way of review here to the whole structure of this section, um, I'm a very visual person, so I hope it helps you when I can try to get it in a visual form. Uh, But the whole theme is genuine faith works, and we have that phrase over and over, faith without works is dead. And in this section, James has four different examples of faith that either doesn't work or work. He has the hungry brother, which is what we'll cover this morning. He talks about the faith of demons. Then he goes to the positive examples of the faith of Abraham and Rahab. And as it was summarized by Wearsby, a dead faith, a demonic faith, and a dynamic faith. Now, as we go into this one this morning with the hungry brother, who has a, the person here has a dead faith, uh, this is going to be, I, I call it a faith that fails to help. A faith that fails to act. A faith, it's a failed faith. Now, I'm going to, right off the bat, I only have one point for today. The next point is the demonic faith of next week. So, uh, everything is just sub-points from here on out. Um, 
But our verse here reads, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So James is pulling in here an illustration of a man who is in need, he's hungry, he doesn't have proper clothing, and the response is nothing. You do nothing. Um, Now, the term naked here, it's not necessarily to mean he was completely bare naked. Um, Most commentators think it was just mean he he was ill-clothed. However, that term also comes up if you just didn't have proper clothing for an occasion. So, for instance, um, there is a little seeming hint here in verse 16 because it says, Be warmed and filled. Um, He probably needed the clothes for the weather, whether at nighttime or whatnot. Um, But clearly he, he didn't have proper clothing. It wasn't adequate for public appearance. Also here, he's destitute of daily food. He is at the end of his rope. He's got nothing. Um, we sometimes struggle in our own culture because people who, who are in need and we're looking at them going, you're not that bad off. You know, sometimes it's like, if you got money for this, how, how come you don't have money for that? Um, and, and that can happen. But this guy is destitute. He says daily food. He doesn't have his next meal. He doesn't have the means to get another meal. He's hopeless. He, he has no hope um, of where that next meal is going to come from. And the response of this and presumed believer, someone who's claiming to have faith, is they say to him, so this onlooker, this believer says, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled. So he gives them some words of hope. Some, he might have even said some of the promises of God, like God will provide all your needs and, and God watches over his children and God takes care of his own, and he will take care of you. Okay, those are all nice things, and they're true. But this man says that, and then on the flip side, he gives him nothing, and he walks away. And James is like, what good is it? What does this profit? Is there any point in even saying what you said? Now, it shows us a couple things, this man's response. It shows him, us a few things about this individual. He's claiming to have faith. And we can, we can assume that to be a faith in God and, and, a, and a faith not just limited to the idea of exercising faith, but he's claiming faith also maybe in the realm of being a Christian, of, of having the faith. Okay? Um, so he's claiming that he is a believer in God You can trust God. He does nothing. Well, this is clear violation of the Old Testament laws. In Deuteronomy and Leviticus, they were told what to do in regards to helping the poor and helping other people. In fact, you get into some of the nitty-gritty laws of Leviticus, and it's like, what? You know, this it seems strange to us, like when they reaped their field, they were not allowed to reap the corners. They couldn't, God said, don't reap that. Leave that for the poor and widow. When they got, went over their olive trees and they were gathering the olives, they could get them once, but the olives that weren't ready to be picked, they couldn't go back for. That was for the poor. When they harvested their field, if they left some sheaves out in the field and then forgot about them, they were not allowed to go back for those the next day. They were done. That was for the poor. So God had provisions set up within that system where the poor and destitute could actually provide for themselves. There was work available. Now, like the corner of the fields illustration, that was really kind of up to the landowner. If he wanted to be generous to the poor, he he could consider that corner even less, you know, so that there's more corner in the field, he harvests less. Uh, There's a bit of... um, leeway there with how much generosity the landowner wants to show. But God provided for the poor in those ways. So here, if, if this man is saying, hey, hey, be warmed, be filled, have a nice day, I hope things go well for you, and he does nothing to help this person's need, he's not, he's not fulfilling the law, even the Old Testament law, of caring for those in need. Um, And it proves he didn't live out God's word. 
The other, the other aspect of this that's important is the man who's claiming to have faith, he's asking for this poor person to exercise faith. Yeah, you there in dirty clothes, and you that you don't have your next meal, you just need to have faith. When he fails to have his own faith. You see, because he wants this man to have faith when he's got clothes, he's got food, he's got provisions, but he doesn't want to give them up. Sometimes the way God helps the poor, yeah, I say most of the time, is not by dropping things in their lap, but it's by having people help. God is not interested in doing good works for the poor just on his own. He wants to use you, and he wants to use me. Now this goes to a concept we talked about a little bit in Sunday school, where... We as humans are made in the image of God. God made us in his image. That makes us unique from the animals. That makes us unique from the the plants. That makes us unique from the rest of creation. We are made in his image. And though theologians have debated what is that, is that image conscience or rational ability or emotion? And then the more we discover about animals, they have a lot of those traits too. Um, not necessarily all, but it's like, well, is it the fact that I have a body and a spirit, or is it... I think, in my understanding, I'm not telling you it's perfect or right, but I think the point is, you are the imager of God. God made humans to image who He is. Thus, when God is creative and He creates the world, God made us to be creative and to be industrious. And to do things. When God is good, he wants you and me to be good to others. When God is kind, he wants us to be kind. We image him. We reflect him like the moon reflects the sun. So, in this passage here, no, I'm not saying the person of faith is God. I'm saying, why don't you show some of the character of God by helping the poor? Why don't you show some of the love of God by taking care of them? Why don't you do that? Why don't you image God? It's God who makes promises like, I will provide your needs. Why is it such a stretch for us to think that God's going to provide this person's needs and he's going to use me to do it? Um, This might fit well with the concept from the book of Esther where Mordecai says to Esther when she's put into a position of power, uh, not necessarily power, but she's the queen and she's in connection to the man who can change everything, the king. And she's afraid of going into the court because if he doesn't extend the scepter, she's going to die. And Mordecai says to her, look, you've got to tell the king what's going on. You've got to reveal what Haman's plot is against the Jews. And who's to know? And and Mordecai says to Esther, he says, um, Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? How do you know that God hasn't placed you across the path of this poor person, this person in need, to be the person who helps them? To be the person through which the love of Christ can be seen? Now, we, we might be comfortable saying, well, we can say something nice like, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. But what good is that? If we don't engage, if we don't help, if we don't step out of our comfort zone and exercise the faith we claim to have and actually help them. There are always going to be poor people. Always. Always. Christ said, the poor will be with you always. I think we should have some good practice in helping by the time we get to heaven. Because they're always around. Uh, It doesn't matter what city or what culture, there will be poor people. Now, granted, a poor person here in the United States is probably doing better off than a poor person in Africa. I get it. You know, I understand that. Um, But there will always be people in need. And James moves on here. And, and he summarizes what, what had just happened. He said, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. 
This is his conclusion. If you've got faith, but it's not working in some way, it's dead. It's like having a battery that's not charged. You've got the battery, but it's dead. We've had issues with that with our car. I've never fully figured it out. But it seems like every winter, the battery dies. And we put a trickle charge on it, it'll be fine. But you go out in the morning, and if that car won't start, it's, that battery is useless. Now, it can be a hunk of metal that sits in my car that takes up space, but unless it has a charge to it, it's useless. Our faith is intended to do something. And again, back to the illustration I used last week of like an extension cord. Our faith is to be connected to God, who is the faithful one, and connected at the other end to a situation of need. Now that faith could be need in your own life, a victory over sin, but that faith could also be this poor person in need. And instead of connecting in and plugging in your faith, trusting that, okay, I just bought groceries for me, this is going to make my budget tight, this is going to make things, I I don't really have enough money for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Instead of you exercising the faith, you're saying, you over there, you exercise faith, I don't have the money or time to. Um, It's funny how faith works and how it gets talked about. There's a story of Hudson Taylor, a missionary to China. Um, He he was in a situation where there was a family. They were destitute. They were poor. And he was poor. He was a poor college student who didn't have much money. He didn't have a lot of means. And he recognized that because of their living condition, one of the parents was going to be dying soon. It was was just going to happen. He had one coin in his pocket, and it was more than he was willing to give. Uh, He wished he had some change to give him something else, but he didn't. That was the only coin he had. He didn't have any money in the bank and any money in his possession. He was currently living on such a tight budget that he would buy bread on the way to school. He would only get pick up half the loaf when he bought it. He would eat that half in the morning, And he wouldn't come back and pick up the other half till after school because he knew he'd be so hungry by that point in the day that he would have eaten the other half sooner. So the baker keeps the other half of bread just so when he comes home, he's got something to eat on the way home. That's how poor he was. He's got one coin, and he gives it to that family. And the Holy Spirit said, look, if you can't trust me here, you're never going to be able to trust me in China. And he gives it to that family, and he steps out on faith. And it wasn't long until God provided it. And if I'm not mistaken, it was he was given a pair of gloves, and he didn't realize it. Um, But the gloves each had like a a bill inside each of the fingers. Um, And I think he already had the gloves. They hadn't. He just hadn't put them on yet to find that money. But you'll hear preachers or people talk about faith like that. And then on the flip side, they don't exercise it. They don't do it. Some of us have been there at times when we have to put it all on the line and trust the Lord. That's exactly what's going on here. You and I, we may have clothes, we may have food, we need to be willing to step into the uncomfortable to obey the Lord. Faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead being alone. James now deals with a rebuttal. Now, I'm going, to read, I'm going to read a section of a commentary here. I read this and I thought, oh, this, this perfectly sums up this verse. Uh, it doesn't answer questions, it just sums it up. This is from uh, William Vaudner. He says, There's a great irony in the interpretation of James 2, 18-19. To the casual reader, the sense is clear. James is concerned that the kind of faith which is, uh, which is his special concern in the letter must not be separated from appropriate accompanying deeds. That living faith is not just creedal, or just not a statement of creeds, of what you, you say you believe. Um, it's an affirmation of doctrinal truth, but it manifests itself. So basically what Wagner says, this is pretty easy to understand. James is talking about faith. It needs to be connected with deeds. The irony is this. He says, When scholars examine the details of the text, however, it bristles with some knotty problems. One scholar observed that James 2.18 is one of the most difficult New Testament passages in general. 
The quotation is a simple one when James is speaking uh, during uh, the brief but sp- spirited exchange of diatribe and when his inter- interlocutor, yes, that's the term, sorry, it's the debater here, it's a term for the debater, when he's speaking and when do they switch. What Wagner is saying here is this verse is hard to interpret. Now, let's just read it and I want, I want, I want some feedback what you're thinking. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Any thoughts? What's it saying? Okay, Jim says it's simple. Go for it. Okay. Man says he has faith. Right? And I have works. Okay. Right? You have a job. So this guy's down, filthy, dirty. Hey, come for me. I will give you work. I will give you money to go to whatever. Okay? That's the faith by the work. So so your faith is plugged in and working and it's it's on display. Right. That is one of the interpretations taken. Any any other thoughts? Anybody look at that a little differently? And there's good reason for this. And I, and I have a, a preaching point here that... If you can't show your works, how can you show your faith? Yeah, okay. Good. Uh, yep. I am, I am totally comfortable as your pastor to say I don't know. I'm going to tell you that right now. Okay? Um, because there are certain passages that could go multiple ways and good men differ. Um, I think I opened 70 to 100 commentaries on this, and all of them were just like, all across the board. So, the, here's a key question. What is the speaker's role? Three roles are given to the speaker. One is he's actually an ally of James. He's coming alongside James' argument where he says, uh, in verse 17, faith without works is dead, being alone. The man's coming alongside James and saying, yes, and on top of that, uh, you know, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. I don't think that's a, the greatest one. And the reason is, is when you get to verse, um, is it 19? No, verse 20. Uh, James says, but wilt thou know, O vain man? So the O vain man seems like this is, this is a bit of a debate here. This is a bit of conflict. So I'm not sure I like the idea of the ally, although some good men have taken that. Others have said it's the opponent of James, kind of like what James is saying here. And he's saying, look, I have faith. Well, I'm going to have to get back to that because you'll see in a minute why. The third option here that, that often is taken is that this is a third party. So there's a hypothetical of two different types of people in the church. Some say they have faith and some they say have, they have works. So this would be getting into the idea more of uh, like Paul talked about spiritual gifts in the church. One of the gifts that Paul mentioned is the gift of faith. So a person could say basically, well, you know, you got faith, that's great, I got works. We're both believers, we're both Christians, we're, we're just, that's who we are. And James says, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Everybody should have faith and everybody should have works. Now you may have the gift of faith, like we might look at people like Hudson Taylor or George Mueller as having a gift of faith where it's, it's above and beyond what we normally see in the Christian life. Um, but that's kind of where the third party, these two different factions or gifts in the church. The other major question that makes this difficult is this. What does the speaker say? Okay, now, we are fortunate in English, we use something called quotation marks. Okay? And this, we are losing our ability to speak English with the texting culture. Okay? We, we all see and understand that. But when you see something, John said, we put quotation marks around it. So we know exactly it was that John said, what it was he said, where his quote stops. Greek did not do that. In fact, in most of the manuscripts, the, there were not even spaces between the letters. You had to determine where the word stopped and where the next word started. Um, so, 
it makes this a little tricky. So some commentators have proposed that, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and then James interrupts back in and he says, I have works. Okay, that's, that's right there. Is that kind of what you were looking at it like? Okay. Some have thought the quotation marks moved on out. Thou hast faith and, and I have works. So the guy's saying, look, I have both of these things. Um, and he, he's saying, you know, why don't you show me yours? And, I, and, and you're going to show yours just by your works, and I'm going to show mine by my faith and my works. Others move the quotations all the way to the end of the verse, and there's some that have inclu- put the quotations all the way to the end of the chapter. So this could be saying, well, you have the whole you know, differences in church, whether someone has the gift of faith or not. It could be saying that James is saying, I'm going to prove my faith to you by what I do. Um, faith and works have to be connected. They have to be together. I, myself, personally, I look heavily at verse 17. James says, faith without works is dead being alone. I think that helps here. James is saying, look, faith and works must go together. They have to be connected. Um, so, I don't know. You can, I'm, I'm saying all this. You can read a bunch of commentaries, as I have done, and you know what? You're not going to get a straight answer. And this is my experience. I read one, and it's like, oh, that made a lot of sense, and that fits. And then I read another one and go, oh, that makes sense, too. I am comfortable with that. Because when God inspired Scripture, there were no quotation marks for them to use in Greek. You know what? As the body of Christ, this helps us understand our view of interpretation. Or, I'm sorry, of inspiration and interpretation. Now, the Holy Spirit inspired that. But if good men who believe the Bible have come to this and come out with different conclusions, can they all be right? This is my driving point. It's not one of James's points, but it's my driving point. Can they all be right? Well, not in every case. Sometimes you can't have it. There are some where, like last week, I dealt with all of these options could go together. Uh, But in some cases, not everybody can be right. We have this concept when it comes to illumination of Scripture that the Holy Spirit will guide us. You got something, Jim? Uh huh. Faith in God, He will lead you. Whether it be a format, He will supply you with work. And He has to have somebody to supply this work. Right. Yeah. So as long as you have faith, you both have faith, it will come together and God will put it together. Okay, true. Hold that thought, because I'm talking about how we interpret it. This is my point of what I'm saying. Good men will come to the Bible, men of faith, men who believe God, and they'll come out with different interpretations. That shouldn't alarm us. We, the Holy Spirit guides us. But the truth is, this man comes to the text, and he really knows the ancient culture really well. So he's looking through that lens of of the literature of how it was written. This other man, who's also a man of faith and trusts the Lord, he doesn't have some of the tools in his toolbox that that other guy has. But that doesn't mean God's not speaking to him. That doesn't mean there's not something there that God's going to communicate to him. Now, if what he's coming out with conflicts with the rest of Scripture, you got problems. The Holy Spirit did not promise to give you divine knowledge of all the aspects of the ancient world so you could understand things perfectly, but he did promise you to guide you into truth. You may not come out with a 100% perfect interpretation, and I may not either. When we all get to heaven, guess what? We'll be able to ask God. (laughs) We'll be able to figure it out ourselves um, in that way. But until then, there is ground for difference in our faith. There's a ground for difference in our understanding. Uh, That's why some good men can be in one denomination and not another. Now, it doesn't mean I agree with them. It doesn't mean I want to stand with some of them. But my point here with this verse, 
Uh, Martin de Bellia said this is the most difficult verse to get a full picture of what it means in the New Testament. Look, if good men can come to a verse and differ, there is no reason we have to put a thumb screw on anybody who thinks a little differently than we do. Sure. I, I can't believe because you're a minister that you're absolutely right and I'm wrong. I, I, I went you're, into this with yeah. you. Oh, yeah. And we, we had a, it was a bad deal. Anyway, sure. Providing you don't just start picking out certain verses to use for your benefit and your argument, if you're going to take the whole book. Yes. I have one word for that, or one phrase, cherry picking. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, we read a book, it was a marriage, or I read a book a while back, and it was a, it was a good marriage book, and it was, a, it was an allegory. And at one point in the book, the husband gets, um, gets uh, the, he gets this guy to help him, Mr. One-Liner. And so he gets the verse on wives, submit yourself to your husband. And starts telling his wife, you got to do this, and you got to follow me, and I said this way, this, this is what, and, and completely just thumbscrewing his wife. And his wife didn't have a verse of scripture to say he was wrong, but it just seemed wrong. And later on, another character helped the two through the process because it's also husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. So Glenn, you brought up something very helpful. When you start cherry picking, when you start saying, I want this one, but I'm going to ignore this over here. Yeah. Yeah. To, to me, this also brings up a topic of unity. Because if, if there are a hundred believers, let's say, in, in this area, and, and 25 of those believers think this way, and 25 think a little different this way, for all those hundred to come to the same church might actually cause disunity. Now, I'm not saying they're not believers. But by uniting where you're closely, more closely identified on what you believe, it actually creates more unity. Now, I don't want to say that in such a way that you then have a group that you have unity and you put up your shields and pull out your guns to shoot everybody else. That's not the point. <laughs> um, but James's point, back to his point here. Uh, I've got on my point, my rabbit trail, and I'm <laughs> back to James's point here. The overarching point, faith and works go together. I, I think personally that whole phrase, thou hast faith, um, is what the arguer says, and I think James jumps in here with, I have works, trying to show that, hey, it's by works that I display my faith. Um, I have a few summary quotes, different commentators, what they've said about the verse that I th- think is helpful. There is much there is as much necessity that faith and works should be united to cons- constitute true religion as there is that a body and soul should be united to constitute a living man. John Corson, uh, he's still alive, he said, um, It is not faith and works that saves a man. It is not faith or works. It is faith that works. The uh, Bible Knowledge Commentary put it this way, Workless faith is worthless faith. It is unproductive, sterile, barren, dead. Um, The old commentators, James Fawcett and Brown, said that a tree shows its life by its fruit, right? But does the fruit come right away? There is an element here we have to be careful because sometimes a person, they honestly and they truly have faith, but just because we can't see the fruit doesn't mean we should be judging. That fruit may be coming. 
But we just don't see it. Um, and there, there's a, a reality there as well. So this here covers at least the hungry brother, the, the dead faith, a, a faith that doesn't work. It doesn't connect with the poor and help those in need. It's a superficial faith. It's, a, it's, a, it's only in the mouth something they say. They say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but they do nothing. And it's a dead faith. Next week we'll, we'll jump into a demonic faith and, and what happens there with the demons. And I may cover some of the others. I'm not, not sure. Um, but by way of application, if you were put on trial this week for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? James is saying your faith and my faith should be plugged into things that affect people. Would there be enough connections that we've plugged into to be convicted for what we believe? Or would the world look at it and say, yeah, that, that's just a superficial thing? Did you pass, or do you pass people who are in need? Do you leave them by? Uh, I, last week we went up to Douglas, and I was just, I had been studying this passage and looking at it, and there was a family up there in Douglas on the side of the road. Were they charlatans? I don't know. They could be. I, I don't know. But I saw two kids there in a minivan, and it's hot out. And I'm like, they got to sign up, need help, anything will help. And you know, as, as Americans, we kind of have a response to this. And it's, it's there are charlatans, and we want to be careful. You just don't want to be so afraid of, of financial loss that you, you fail to help those who are truly in need. And so I, I stopped by Safeway and I picked up some groceries. Um, and you can call me a cheapskate if you want. That's fine. I got a cheap loaf of bread, cheese, bologna. And since I saw kids, I got them a couple Lunchables. And I got a case of water. I think I spent 20 bucks. And I drove over. They didn't know I had done that. And I, I drove over and I said, what's wrong? And the story was, again, story, I, I don't know. They said, our van broke down. The money we had for gas to get home we had to fix the van instead. And we're just trying to get home. They had Texas plates. They said Texas was home. I'm like, well, at least that part of the story matches up. Um, gave them the food. I figured at least, if they are lying through their teeth, at least the kids will have a little better time of it. Um, but I gave them the food and went on. And, uh, you know, somebody else, I think, was going to help them with the hotel or whatever. And they were, they were thankful to get anything. Uh, they weren't just wanting money. And so I, I don't know. Were they charlatans? Maybe. But I'll tell you what, if they weren't, with the food I gave them, I gave them a track. If those kids are living with parents who are charlatans, the worst that can happen is those kids see there's people out there who do care. There's people out there who do show the love of Christ. And I didn't do that just to have a sermon illustration, but the point is, we should be doing that. And I have no problem. If you want to try to screen and filter to, to look for people who are fraud, I, that's fine. But don't let your filter become so complicated and so rigid that you never help anyone. If you do that, you're... Well, good. How many times have I known about a Walmart parking lot or any of these places and you see the signs all the time? Right. Yeah. I have an issue with that. Oh, I understand. Because they had the money to buy the cigarette, right? <laughs> but they didn't have the money for... Yeah. I don't think so. Because you're trying... Now, we do need to help people. And sometimes help in those situations is... You had money for the cigarette. I've seen old yeah. I You know, and, and in our culture, we're, we're a bit nervous if they only want money. And I understand that. I had a lady come up to me, and I don't know, they know how to pick certain people out in crowds, and I don't know what it is. A lady came up to me at Walmart down in Cheyenne and said, Sir, can I have five bucks? We're staying in the camper, the back of the parking lot, and we don't have enough money for the propane to heat the heater for tonight. 
can I have five bucks for that? Well, I don't carry cash. I just, I, if I have a little bit of cash on me, you have hit me at a rare time. <laughs> So I said, no, I don't have any cash, but why don't you come in with me and I'll buy it for you. And you could say I was judging, I guess, but depending on her response was kind of depending on what I was going to do. And I I said I was going to do it, so I'm going to at least get one here. Sold them in packs of two. All she wanted was one. But I sent her out with four because I knew that she's not just trying to get some money here. She desperately needs some something to stay warm and it's cold in wyoming (laughs) i would not want to be in a truck camper at night in wyoming so um i i sent her for and and she was so thankful for that um so there are those times and yes we live in a realm of there are people who yeah i don't i need help yeah Oh, no, that's fine. But it was in the wintertime. We had two or three little kids. I don't know how many. I don't remember. Anyway, I said, we way behind on the gas. So I said, well, how much is it? He said, $400. I said, well, okay, I'm going to give you 400 bucks to pay your gas bill. And I'm going to see these kids. The next Monday, this was on Friday or Thursday, the next Monday, I said, how was your weekend? Wonderful. We went to Newcastle, went out with some <laughs> friends to a steakhouse up there. I'll tell you what, it, that, it, it puts a crimp in your faith and yellow man. Yeah. All of us, and I've seen the guy repeatedly over the years. He was driving a Mustang. <laughs> I've never yet had him say, I'd like to pay you back what you give me. Not that I wanted it back. I didn't intend to get here today, but there's a couple books that I've, I haven't read them yet, but I've, I've read the dust jackets. One of them's titled, When Helping Hurts. Okay? There are people who are working the system. And the problem is, with passages like what we dealt with today, they create in Christians a sense of, of need and to give, and that's good. We're to help those in need and show the love of Christ. But you know, there's some people in need who are there because of their own doing, and they're not willing to change. Well, I'm not telling you. Oh, no. no I, I, I don't want that. But we've all been there. We, we've all been there where someone... It's happened from the church here. People will call the church and want money. I need help with the electric bill. And then you go over and they're in the middle of a remodel project. And I'm like, uh, did, was there a plumbing issue that ruined a bunch of stuff? Or, oh no, we're just redoing all this. And it's like, why would I help you with your electric bill when you got money to remodel? You, you know, so sometimes the helping. It, it, yeah, sometimes the helping, and, and here's a key turn, is enabling. Now, as believers, we've got to walk in the Spirit because we can't become so afraid of enabling someone that we never help anyone, but we also can't. We've got to show the love of Christ. What were you saying, Jim? That is a wonderful point, because here, the person who's claiming to have faith, they have to step out on faith and say, okay, even if this person is, is going to take, take me to town on this, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. They may take me to town. I'm going to still have faith in God, he's going to provide my needs. And, and I, with a clean conscience, I may have done the right thing. Now, I may not give that person money again. You know what I mean? But. <laughs> well, and even there, sometimes I would struggle with that. Personally, I mean, because if I went and paid that electric bill, but I still knew they were spending the money they had elsewhere, I've still enabled them. 
So, so it's a. Yeah. If you have true faith, mm -hmm. it will come back in full. I've done that more than yeah. once. Step up and I did have something and gave it, knowing that maybe it will, maybe it won't. But later on in time, I received a check in the mail from something I forgot about years ago. Yeah. So it does come back. You just got to look at the. I have a, f it, I, I have a financial way of looking at things. I view God as a bank. Okay, now, not, don't take me too far and too wrong here. Um, God is not like a, a bank, like the building. But when we give to God, the bank of heaven gives better interest, better dividends, and has better benefits than any earthly bank. And when we t take care of the poor and needy, and we give to the work of the Lord, the bank of heaven gives better dividends than any other bank. But there's some catches to that bank of heaven. This bank on earth I can walk to and I can say I want my money and I want it now and I want to close up my account. I want it all. And they'll give it to me as long as it's not tied up. But if it's in CDs or something, I might have to pay fees, but I can get it back. But the bank of the heaven doesn't work that way. Bank of heaven, you've got to continue to walk with him. And you may go to the bank of heaven and say, Lord, I need this and I need it now. And God says, no, you don't need it now. Just trust me. And his plans are always better than ours. Uh, and, and the other thing I wanted to say was, just because you don't give something to somebody, doesn't mean that you're not walking in the faith. True. You know, the Holy Spirit has a way of giving you that gut feeling of, mm, something's not right here. I shouldn't do this, you know. Did you have something, babe, before I go? Right. We can rest on the fact that yes, he took advantage of me, but God will take care of him down the road. We don't have to worry about it. This even works on large scales. Make it very simple. Uh -huh. Bingo. You cannot outgive God. And whether that's giving to the church or whether that's helping people, you cannot outgive God. God. I think it's Proverbs that says, He that giveth to the poor lendeth to God, um, or something along those lines. We were in a church, my wife and I, and the church was struggling financially. You know, knock on wood, that never happens here, right? Uh, <laughs> the church was struggling financially. And we as a couple, we didn't have kids at the time, we decided to sacrificially give. And we gave a lot back. We didn't have a big salary, but we gave a lot of it back. It came to the point where I was asked by the pastor to go buy some things at the grocery store for a fellowship coming up. And this was not me buy them and get reimbursed. This was me buy them, period. And it was less than like $7 or $15 or whatever. And I finally had to tell him, I don't have that much money in my bank account. I can't do it. I'm not going to buy it on credit. And I got to school and like I was a little child. And I'm thinking, I've been giving back to this church, to the Lord, for years. Or at least as long as we had been there. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I'm going to roll with this punch and go with it. When we moved out here to Wyoming, no connection back there. When it was getting time where we needed to get a house, the church here in Wyoming took up an offering. And when they wrote it and cut us a check, it was $11,000. They said, go buy a house. This will be your down payment. And when I did the math, that was about a, within $100, the amount of money we had put into the church we were at before. That is my maybe illustration of God gives you what you need when you need it. He provides your need in ways you don't expect it. And so if we have a fear of helping others because we're going to get took, we have a we have a faith that is faulty. But that so here the fear of finance stop um, or stop, make you lose your compassion. If you're so afraid of losing money, you will be paralyzed. 
But if you just focus on walking with God and letting the Holy Spirit tell you, should I help this person or not? He will. And your heart may be telling you, I really need to help this person. And there's that, that Holy Spirit just puts a nag. No, don't do it here. That's fine. And maybe, guess what? Maybe you give someone some money and they are a charlatan. If you're walking with the Lord, you will walk away with a blessing. You know that? Because even if they lied to you and you don't know it, you will at least feel good that you helped them. Now, it does feel pretty bitter after they pull some shenanigans like you mentioned. But at least you've done the right thing. And no, if someone pulls shenanigans, no, you don't need to give them money again. Maybe you need to sit down with them and give them something else called a lesson. And I don't mean, you know, you beat them up or anything like that. I mean, you just say, look, if you're claiming to be a Christian, you're claiming to walk with God, you're claiming to have these things, um, why don't you live like it? Your faith must be connected to what you do. I've tried to help some people, various people with, with budgets and different things. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Pastor, I don't have money. I need money. I need help. I need... Well, you got money for this. Oh, yeah, yeah. And how much do you spend on this? Oh, not very much. It's like, really? Really? I mean, I'm not stupid. Um, I may look it, but I'm I'm not stupid. Folks, we can walk with the Lord. We can be generous. And I would argue here, maybe there's ways that we as a church should think and look about helping people within our community. I don't know what that would be, and I don't know what that would look like. But I think as a body of believers... We could figure out something. So let's close in prayer. Very interactive sermon today. I don't mind it at all. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we want to live by faith. We don't want to be like this person James illustrates here who simply says nice things and says Bible verses or whatnot to someone in need. We want to be the type of Christians who have a faith that knows what it is to have the rubber meet the road. And Father, as we are trying to have our faith meet the road, and and we're trying to engage, Lord, we've been burnt with people who who are deceptive and people who are, are, are not doing the right thing. And Father, we ask that you would help us to navigate through life. Lord, would you enable us to show compassion and and the love of Christ to those in need? And Lord, use that to open up doors to share our faith. And Lord, also, would you, Lord, protect us from those who have nothing more than ill intent of making a quick buck by deceiving others. Lord, help us to walk in the light as you are in the light as we simply listen to you and trust you for the guidance and direction of what to do in every situation, Lord, we ask that our actions would be demonstrating our faith here in Guernsey, in this area. And Lord, would would our love for you be seen through what we do in our community. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen. <laughs>